Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's uh, get this ball rolling. Uh, what I plan to do is uh, run through a few slides just to give you a little sense for uh, what's happening. So a little reset here. We'll uh, start by talking about the trend meter, uh, which I think is a tool that's uh, very useful and powerful that I would like you to uh, get a sense for. And then uh, Aaron had asked me about how we could use this thing for sector rotation and market momentum. So I will uh, show you a few slides just to give you a little overview and a sense for how these things can be used. And then um, eventually, I hope we can answer lots and lots of questions. So that's where we are. All right. Uh, so the trend meter is really uh, answering the question, is this market trending? So uh, if you were to eyeball a chart, uh, this is like eyeballing a chart, but converting it into a number. And the question is, how strongly is it trending? So the main thing to remember is that this is absolute trend strength as opposed to relative trend strength. And uh, to be honest, it's just been born from years of experience and frustration because uh, there's always, this is a question that uh, is difficult to answer, has a thousand different answers, and this is my attempt to quantify it. Okay. So what are the design challenges? The first design challenge is what indicators to pick. So since uh, I wanted to talk about momentum, I've picked a lot of different momentum indicators. The really hard problem is how do you weight these indicators to get a consistent scale? So I wanted to scale from zero to 100. So the problem is uh, how do you weight these things so they always uh, give you a number between zero and 100? And then the question finally becomes, how sensitive should this thing be? How quickly do you want it to respond or not respond? And since I wanted to do trend following, I wanted something that was somewhat slow, but you know, not like real slow. So you can imagine that uh, there are like a million choices. And uh, depending on how you've been sleeping and what you've been drinking, you might you know, make a different choice uh, when, you make the, when you're part of the design. So here's an example uh, of uh, Nectar, which kind of illustrates the uh, problem and the solution nicely. So Nectar was, uh, if it, the lower panel has the CTM, you can see there are different colors uh, going from bright green above 90 to say pink below 20. So the left-hand side of the chart, you can see that the values were below 20 because it was trending low, trending down. And then whatever new information came into the market convinced the buyers to come in and prices started rising. Eventually, we had this massive breakout, and you can see that uh, the CTM went above 90 and stayed above 90 for the duration of the move. So clearly, the scale is from 0 to 100. When it's trending down or trending low or trending downwards, it's z below 20, maybe close to 0. And if it's moving up very strongly, it's near 100 or above 90. So very easy. Eyeball the chart. Give me a number. The next chart shows you the application of the CTM to four different time frames for the Dow 30, looking back over you know, the last few months. So uh, on the upper left-hand corner, I have a 30-minute chart. Uh, then next to it, I have a daily chart. In the lower half, I have a weekly chart and a monthly chart. And you can see that the CTM values are all different, and it scales very seamlessly from one time frame to another. And this is a very, very useful and very, very powerful feature. And why is that? Because if you were to ask two technicians to eyeball a chart, as soon as you change from, say, daily to weekly, they're going to see a whole bunch of different things, and they're not going to weigh the different indicators in the same way. Whereas because it's a computer, it weighs everything consistently and uh, you know, seamlessly changes time frames, and it means the same thing. So a value of 80 on the daily means the same thing as 80 on the monthly and 80 on the 30-minute chart. So this is a really dynamite and powerful feature and an important uh, tool, Im important way to use the tool. So just to summarize, uh, you can use CTM on any time scale. It does the same thing and means the same thing. And this is a lot harder to accomplish than uh, you might think uh, uh, you know, in, in the real world. Okay. So uh, what kind of trading strategies can we use? Uh, we can have trend following or momentum strategies and counter trend or value strategies. So when it's strong, say above 80, and you want to be a trend follower, you want to buy that object or consider buying the object. Conversely, if you're a counter trend or value person, you'd say, I'm going to think of selling this thing because it's too strong. The reverse is also true. If CTM is weak and below 20, then that object is a candidate for selling a shorting. Conversely, if you're a counter trend player, you would 
consider buying that object. So a variety of trends following and uh, momentum slash value strategies are possible based on what the CTM is doing. And the important thing is that you're applying many different indicators and in different time frames and getting a single number. So you can imagine that it makes it very easy to compare across uh, different markets or, uh, or trading vehicles. Hey, Tushar, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Um, when you look at these readings and you say, like, for instance, a trend follower, you know, would buy when, it got, when it's above 80, you know, when, it, when you look at it visually, it kind of looks like an RSI. But, you know, an RSI, of course, 70 or 80 means it's overbought. Is this telling us simply that it's a strong momentum or is it telling us that the security is overbought when it's above, you know, up in the 80s? Uh, first of all, uh, RSI is a very, very small part of it, even though it may look like the RSI. Okay. And the market is trending, which is what we want. You know that the RSI can remain above 80 forever or for a very long time or much longer than a few days. Conversely, it can stay below 20 for a very long time or many weeks or months. And if you look at, for example, if I were to just scroll back to the Dow chart, the lower right-hand corner, you can see that uh, it's a monthly chart and the CTM has stayed above 90 for many months in a row. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I hesitate to use words like uh, overbought and oversold because they only make sense when the market is going sideways. When the market is trending, overbought and oversold don't mean anything because it can remain overbought for a long time or remain oversold for a long time, where the time obviously depends on whether you're using daily or weekly or monthly. So uh, uh, I, I would hesitate to use words like overbought because that implies that it's going to come down right away. It doesn't have to come down right away. And even if you look at the RSI, uh, it's quote overbought. You can quote relieve the overbought condition if the market goes sideways. So the, uh, so the value of the RSI above 70 does not predict the amplitude of price movement required to relieve the so-called overbought condition. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, fundamentally a uh, disservice uh, to constantly say something is overbought. The correct answer is, is it trending? Because if it's trending, it can remain over, overbought slash oversold for very long periods of time. And uh, as I sh on the screen, you can see the monthly chart or the weekly chart, for example, uh, you know, for this entire move, uh, going back to February of uh, 2016, the, RS, the, the CTM value has stayed uh, at a very high level for this entire rally. So if you said that, oh, it's overbought, I shouldn't buy, you would have missed the entire rally. So uh, I hesitate to use words like overbought or oversold. The only thing that matters is, is it trending and is it trending powerfully? Uh, because then you can use a trend following strategy. And things like overbought or oversold are labels that are not valid when the market is trending strongly. Okay. Okay. I did. You. I got a, a question that's sort of follows in that. Go ahead. Um, it says, is it reasonable to use diagonal trend lines with the uh, trend meter or rely strictly on the horizontal support and resistance levels, those color transitions, oh, I which I think uh, is pretty much what we were discussing. Right. Uh, yes, uh, you, you can use them if you want, but I, I would prefer to just use the horizontal trend lines because, again, uh, what happens is suppose you draw a trend line and it breaks a trend line. Well, what does that mean? Is it going to go all the way down to zero? Not necessarily. It could just go down to, say, from 90 to 80 and then go back up to 90 again. So, uh, you know, I think the horizontal lines are uh, less controversial, uh, require less trading, uh, less stressful, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. But, yeah. uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, I, I, no, you can use a, a longer term indicator for shorter term trading. So if you want to use trend lines, I'm not discouraging it. It depends on how you want to trade it. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, the horizontal lines uh, serve the design goal of making it a trend following tool. But as I have said, you can use, you know, you can use counter trend uh, ideas with the CTM as well. Okay. Is there any yeah, more questions? Excellent. I, well, I mean, I, we have some uh, Kind of some general ones, uh, but I think I'll save those for after. All right, excellent. So uh, uh, in terms of the takeaways, uh, it's uh, CTM is very simple and very powerful because it gives you a single number. And the value of that is enormous because you can change time frames and you can come back tomorrow or come back a week from now, you'll get the same number. Uh, whereas opinions, unfortunately, uh, you know, they might not be exactly the same a week from now. Anyway, uh, 
It changes consistently across time scales. That's super important, extremely valuable, especially if you're a big institutional trader and you got this perpetual portfolio that's going to go on forever. You need consistency. Then, as I said, you can use it for trend following a counter trend. And it's really ideal for scanning, ranking, and screening. It's objective. It's not a matter of opinion. It's going to stay the same six months from now. And it's, uh, so it's just a dynamite tool. And uh, basically, you can piggyback on my years of, uh, you know, having my finger in the blender, uh, you know, all the troubles and tri tribulations of trend following. All right. So those are the takeaways. And I will do a slight change of, uh, of pace here and talk about sector rotation. That is an application of uh, the CTM to sector rotation. Uh, both Aaron and Tom were interested. So I presume uh, the big wide world is out there is also interested. So uh, what I've done here is uh, I've simply put uh, the major sectors and indexes into a chart list, plug the chart list into the scan engine at stock charts and said rank by daily Chande trend meter. So I have, uh, so you can't really see the numbers, but the extreme right hand side has uh, daily values for the trend meter. And of course, uh, for some people that may be too volatile. So then we can replace that with weekly values of the daily trend meter. So all we're saying is, rank these uh, X number of uh, you know, sectors or markets or, or ETFs or stocks using either the daily uh, CTM or the weekly CTM. And let's see what it, uh, let's see, let's see what it shows. Uh, so and you can do that very easily with the scan engine. And all you need to do is you can put whatever conditions you want. And this at the last bit add rank by Chande Trend Meter. So those five or six words will uh, unlock the magic uh, of scan engine for you. All right. So this chart shows a plot of the sector daily trend strength. So the vertical axis is the trend meter. If it's, uh, say, I, you know, it's below 20, I, I call it one star for ease. Uh, it's trending down or trending uh, you know, down very strongly. If it's above 90, I call it five stars, trending up very strongly. So if you look at the left-hand side, we have things like XLY, XLF, financials, discretionary, and uh, the and say uh, dis both types of the discretionary ex uh, consumer discretionary consumer staples, and then the Dow and the S and P, and then all the way on the right hand side you have technology, healthcare, and the dollar. So clearly this is telling you that the indexes themselves are very strong, the financials are very strong, for example, and the technology is weak. So you've captured market rotation, uh, but we've put this on a horizontal chart. Uh, for the moment. Now we can do the same thing with the weekly chart. And obviously the weekly chart will bounce around less because it has more smoothing. The story is more or less the same. Again, the vertical axis goes from zero to 100. 100 means it's trending very strongly. Zero means it's trending down very strongly. And 100 means it's trending up very strongly. So anything above 90, you know, you're in fat city. Uh, you got uh, Dow and the XLY and the SPY and the industrials and the financials trending very strongly. Uh, to the right-hand side, you have energy trending uh, down or just only moderately and the dollar being very weak. So again, we've, we've looked at the relative performance and the absolute performance and we stretched it out on a, on a horizontal line, right? But if you remember, if I go back a couple of uh, tables up here, this was on a table. So uh, one column here that you can't see is a scooter and the other column over here is the trend meter. And the scooter gives us the relative performance and the CTM gives us the absolute performance. So uh, what we can do is we can take a difference from the SPY using that as our zero, zero reference and plot something like this. So here what we've done is this, uh, the horizontal axis represents the difference in the daily scooter value. So this is difference in relative performance. The vertical axis is the difference in the daily CTM value. So it's a difference in the absolute strength. The chart, what does the chart look like? And at zero, zero, you have SPY. So everything to the right tells us it's stronger uh, on the scooter. Everything on the left tells us it's weaker than the scooter. Everything above tells us it's strong, stronger than the SPY on an absolute basis. Everything below uh, the SPY on the vertical axis tells us it's weaker than the SPY on an absolute basis. So now here you've got your spinny, spinny things that you guys love. Uh, anything in the left-hand quadrant is weak. Anything in the upper right-hand strong quadrant is much stronger than the SPY. And, uh, you know, it'll keep going round and round in circles. So if you want to do sector rotation, you have your rotation about zero, zero right here. And, of course, this is with daily data. So we've got to convince Chip to put this uh, on the Stock Charts website. 
<laughs> and uh, here we go. And we can do the same thing with the daily, uh, with the weekly data. Again, same thing. The horizontal axis is the difference in the daily scooter value, so difference in the daily relative strength. The vertical axis is the difference in the weekly CTM value, so in the weekly absolute trend strength. So you can think of this way: we're comparing price performance on the horizontal axis to the chart patterns on the vertical axis. So it's your uh, ruler versus the eyeball, if you will. And again, you can see anything in the lower left-hand quadrant is much weaker than the market. Anything in the upper right-hand quadrant is much stronger than the market. And you can see right now only the Dow is really much stronger than the SPY. And of course, XLI, XLF are also stronger. So this is the same information as we have on the these tables, but we can plot them as a horizontal in a bar chart, or we can replot them as a two axis difference in scooter, difference in CTM, and see the thing spin around. So for all of you who love sectors and say, I want to be counter trend and buy a weak sector, maybe I'll buy utilities or bonds, or you want to say I only want to buy strength, maybe only I'll buy things in the Dow index. So it just depends on what makes sense to you. But the tool is there, the tool is powerful, the tool is objective, and you don't have to think about it. You know, I, I love it when I don't have to think about things. All right. Uh, and lastly, I'll finish this segment by saying that you can plot the relative performance directly. So here I've plotted the ratio of XLK to XLF, so technology versus financials. And in the lower panel, so it's the ratio of XLK over to XLF, which means when technology is strong, the line should be going up. When technology is weak, the line should be going down. And we can see that very easily here. And you can look at the CTM below. Uh, right after the election, the financials took off. So the ratio was down in the bar. It was in the red or the pink area. So it was trending lower, i.e. technology was weaker than financials. And then we had the strong rally in, and then the financials stumbled because whatever people were not sure they were going to ever get a tax reform done. So you can see that the CTM moved up. It was trending up in the 90. You can see technology was strong. And then after that, we sort of had this uh, more sideways move. And if you look at the last few days, uh, we know that, that there's been a big rotation out of technology into financials. You can see that the line has come down very strongly, which means that uh, financials were strong. And you can see the CTM has come down. And now uh, we're down in the red region, which tells us again that looks like the, the move was so strong and so swift that we were able to push the CTM all the way from, say, above 90 to below 20. So that gives you a sense for whether can this thing respond quickly or not. So uh, another example of uh, using CTM, but here instead of doing it uh, on a spreadsheet, we've directly taken the ratio of two objects or two ETFs, two stocks, and done it that way. And again, the interpretation is the same. 80 means the same thing. 20 means the same thing. And uh, it's really consistent, really easy to use. You don't have to worry about time frame. You can stick the weekly in there or the monthly in there, and you just interpret it exactly the same way all the time. So uh, I really uh, hope that uh, you'll enjoy using this indicator. It's super easy, super consistent, and means the same thing. You can use apples to apples. You can, uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, big cap ETF cannot be compared to the mid cap ETF. So a big cap stock at 80 might not mean exactly the same thing as a CTM, as a, uh, as a small cap at 80, so to speak, because there are different scales. But now you can compare a foreign index to a US index or to a bond fund to a you know, to a Pacific Rim fund because everything is totally homogenized and we don't care what's underneath. We're just looking at the chart. We've converted into a number and now we are off to the races. So uh, very easy to use and I hope uh, all of you will use it some more. All right, I have one question for you, Tushan. And I think this really covers um, probably a question a lot of folks in our audience are thinking because we do have a lot of uh, shorter to intermediate term folks. I mean, we also have a lot of long-term folks as well. But if you're looking at this maybe from a swing trading perspective, right. how it, let's say you had X dollars ready to, to invest today. How would you use the CTM to identify good, solid trading candidates? Is that a fair question? Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I used to be a money manager for a long time. So if you if you remember, I, I put past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Right. So I always start with that. Uh, what I would like to say to you is that um, you have to uh, look at the chart and say uh, if you're looking for a swing trading candidate and you and uh, you want to buy a low, then you're clearly looking for a CTM value that's below 50, right? 
uh, mm-hmm. because you're buying weakness and not buying strength. But if you want to buy a swing candidate and you think, uh, I think this is going to start moving, all you have to do is shift to a lower time frame, a shorter time frame. And when it starts to move, you're going to see it in the CTM value. So uh, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll go back to the chart of the Dow because I think that kind of answers your question. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, you have this 30-minute chart. You see it, it rallied very nicely. You can see the CTM value speaking at 90. So if I were trying to trade a swing trade, and I think that this stock is a candidate, then I would say, well, first of all, on the daily or weekly, it has to be in the yellow region, so it is pulled back. Now I'm looking for a bounce, and I'm going to see the bounce on the intraday chart, say an hour, one-hour chart or a 30-minute chart or whatever, But on the intraday chart, it's going to be a CTM above 80 or above 90. So I'm back to my above 80 being the critical criterion for me. But if you want to do a swing trader, you've got to maybe use a different time frame. So Mm -hmm. that's how I would approach it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think too. And I'm just looking at that 30 minute chart and I'm trying to figure, you know, because I understand the question that's being asked and I I would kind of look at it the same way. I mean, first of all, you've got a monthly CTM that looks very strong. You've got a weekly CTM that's very strong, a daily that's very strong, and then the 30-minute looks like because we've been trending lower for the last couple of days, obviously, right. we're seeing that CTM you know, move back more into like a neutral territory. Right. But when I look back to like the 22nd and 23rd of November, right. I see that same type of pattern that, that maybe you're talking about where you're getting a little bit of a pullback right. in the short term for a chart or a company, in this case, it was the Dow, but you know, that overall from a daily perspective is very bullish. Right. And so timing maybe on a 30 minute chart, that, that makes sense to me when I look at it. Right. So, uh, so uh, I'm back to trend following with a value about 80, but it's on a 30 minute chart. So it makes it a much shorter term deal rather than on a monthly chart. Right. So the, the, I'm applying my principles consistently, but I'm now using a 30 minute chart or a one hour chart to get the swing move because I know it's moving, I can see it going, I can see the CTM is high, you know, but just that because you're looking for a swing, you have to shorten your time horizon. So using an intraday chart rather than a weekly or a daily chart. Got it. So I'm pretty simple and consistent that way. You know, I I don't like to use my imagination. I'd rather use it in the design of the object and then just use it, you know, very systematically after that. I always like to say, if 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 I have to think I'm in trouble, (laughs) <laughs> maybe that's what gets me in trouble i think too much well uh, i've discovered the hard way that the more i think the more in trouble i am anyway uh, that's for another another dollar uh let's talk about market trend check uh, this is how do you apply a slide okay so again a little uh, change of pace i'm going to go away from the ctm discussion and just talk in general about uh, you know how do you think of markets how do you think of uh, you know, how do you apply some of these slightly different ideas, uh, some of my trend following models, just to uh, give something else to talk about. As uh, Tom very kindly mentioned, I have a blog and I, I put this up in my blog from time to time. And uh, if you follow the, the history of the blog, one of the early blogs has all the details of the model or the models. So you can go back and look at it. But uh, the idea is that, again, to go back to where we were a minute ago, sometimes you need a larger perspective just to kind of see what's happening in the market. And then it's easier for you to uh, come down and do whatever. Just for example, some would say, oh, those are technology stocks that sold off. Great. It's a good time to buy technology stocks. Then I'm going to put them on a 30-minute chart. When I see the CTM rising on the 30-minute chart, or whatever it is, or NVIDIA or, I don't know, IPGP, uh, then you might want to consider you know, buying it then. I'm not recommending it, but I'm just showing you the process of getting there. Okay. Uh, so here we have what I call the trend check carpet. Uh, there the are four horizontal rows. I know it looks complicated. For each market, I have... Uh, a strong up, a neutral, and a strong down. So there's a there's a neutral region where you're flat, and green means it's trending up, red means it's trending down, yellow means it's flat. The top line is the short term, which is about a 25-day horizon. The horizon doubles at each step, so 25, 50, 100, and 200 days from top to bottom. Left to right, the number of stocks is Dow 30 all the way to NYSE, which is maybe 2,500 or whatever the magic number is. So you can see that except for the QQQ, in the topmost row, which is neutral, everything else is green. So we've had the sell-off, and uh, so it's affected the short-term technology stocks, but the, mo- the model is saying everything else is green. So if you're a trend follower, hey, it's up. Let's not worry about being overbought. Second, uh, this is uh, here I've just shown four things, bonds, gold, 
S&P and dollar. Again, same time frame. So on the left-hand side, we have bonds. They're neutral in the short term. They're rising in the medium term, neutral in the med intermediate term, and rising in the long term. Uh, gold, you can see, is pretty much flat across the board. Uh, the stocks are rising across the board in all four time frames. The dollar is weaker in the short to medium time frame. It's rising uh, in the upper, in the intermediate time frame because we had this rally up above the towards the 100-day moving average, and the long term is down. So uh, depending on what kind of trader you are, you may be a long-term trader. It's still good to know where the other things are, so you, it might give you entry opportunities, uh, you know, on a different time scale. And then this is what I call the path of least resistance. So this is a, another way of looking at market breadth. So what I've done is I've looked at the Russell 1000 universe, about 1,000 stocks, and I've applied my trend-following models, and I've asked the question, are they going moving up or are they flat to down? So it's just a binary sort, and I've rolled up the numbers. So if more stocks are turning, are moving up, it's in the green. More stocks are flat or down, it's in the red. So right now, despite all the, you know, the shenanigans for the last few days, it's saying that on the whole, at the, at the 1,000 stock level, it's green. But there are more stocks rising than falling. So even though some tech stocks have taken a hit, uh, by and large, on the, market, on the broader market, the trend is still higher. So you can look at it at the index level in terms of price, or you can look at the component level, meaning each of the individual constituents and roll them up. So again, we're consistently, consistently applying the same model across four different time frames. There's no opinion involved, it's straight number crunching, and we plot it out. And this is what the market is doing. You're looking into the market, it's like a market x-ray. What's the path of res least resistance? It's up. But obviously there's a time frame involved, and it's possible that the intermediate term and long term could be up and the short term and medium term could be down. But that doesn't mean that the trend hasn't changed, has changed. The long term trend could be up, but short and medium could be down. So there's always churning in the market. But right now, it's all up. And of course, uh, if I change the underlying universe, you know, I'll get different numbers and so on and so forth. But all I'm saying is there's a consistent way to understand and apply these rules to the market. That is not a matter of opinion. You can look at it across many different time frames and synthesize this information and you know, not have to uh, pay big bucks for Wall Street analysts. Okay, uh, this is a, something I have on my website, uh, what I call dials. So I have summarized lots of different information. Here I look specifically at the QQQ. The dial in the upper row center is the trend meter, that's 63%. To the right is a year ahead forecast. So the trend right now suggesting it's going to be up 24% on average with a plus minus 2% error. The lower two dials are giving you a sense for bulls, the strength of bulls versus the strength of bears. You can see that the bull, the bears are weak, so it's bullish, but the bulls themselves have lost a little bit of their mojo. And that makes sense if you've seen the sell-off for the last few days. The upper, the, the two left-hand dials are medium-term allocation and long-term allocation. So medium term, you can see that the trend has changed and we saw that it was neutral in the other chart. So uh, I'm, I'm showing 35% cash if you're just uh, playing defense. And on the long term, it's only about 70% invested. So this is a pretty conservative uh, allocation, even in these strong trends. And you can see that certainly a 30% cash cushion would have been you know, pretty nice uh, the last few days. Uh, the same story on the analytics dashboard, uh, but this is for financials, and you can see it's all green everywhere. So here we have some yellow, some caution because of short-term events or short-medium-term events, but here everything is pointing straight up. So it's very bullish, uh, bear, the bulls are very strong, bears are very weak, perfect, that's what you want. Trend strength is very high at 19, 95% or 95. Uh, we have a double-digit year-ahead forecast. Uh, the short-term and long-term models are both heavily invested. So this is telling you that strictly from a trend following point of view, the model is saying you should be all in. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that you should be all in. It depends on what your strategy is, but that's what the model is saying. And of course, it will change over time. So if we come back in six months or three months, you know, it could be different. So again, this is another way of saying that we can crunch the numbers and get insight into what's happening in the market by applying the models in a systematic and disciplined way. And of course, um, we had a question about whether um, you've back tested uh, any of the results on the CTM. Have you done any back testing? Oh yeah, I've done plenty of back testing, you know, and uh, it it certainly works. But now uh, the problem you're going to run into is when you do a back test, uh, you're going to have say you know a buy signal on 500 stocks. Are you going to buy 500 stocks? You know, maybe for an institution. 
So uh, by and large, it's just trend following, it's brute force trend following. I can give you examples where it's worked beautifully. I can give you examples where it does not, because that's how prices work. Prices can go up for, you know, for three months and then, you know, fall off bed and never go, about, go higher again for another year. So uh, it's not magic formula. It's just a screening tool. And uh, all I can say to you is uh, just put it on a bunch of charts and eyeball them. You know, it, it's, it's eyeballing converted into a number. But yes, I've tested it and, you know, uh, I, can, uh, I can cherry pick the data and tell you it looks great. I can show you examples where it has not. It's like any other trend following model. Uh, you can get very good signals in a trending market and uh, certainly you'll get some not very good signals in a downtrending market. But by and large, it's uh, very good at identifying uh, the long term or medium term trend. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the questions was, does the CTM use volume? And the answer is no, it does not. So, uh, you know, I, I come from the future side of the trading world uh, where we never really use volume. So I primarily uh, base my analysis on price only. And ultimately, we are trading price, not volume. So the CTM does not use volume in any way. Uh, and I, I've played around with volume, but uh, I've never really found anything particularly fascinating or interesting. So I mostly just focus on price. So it, no, it does not use volume. Then the, uh, another question was, um, is, you know, how does it, how, how is the computation set up? Uh, the computation is really long to discuss or to remember, but I think that if you look at the school, the health pages, uh, on the stock charts website, they do a pretty good job. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the problem really is, you know, how many indicators do you want to put on a page? So imagine if you have a thousand charts with one indicator on each page, hey, that's a challenge. Now, suppose you have 10 indicators on each chart, you got a thousand charts. How are you going to remember individual values and then what happens tomorrow and then next week and so on? So it's uh, sort of almost irrelevant in terms of what you actually have in there. What matters is how is it weighted and how does it work when you change timeframes? And uh, so the struggle for me was figuring out how to set the weights. And uh, uh, I, I think I've done a pretty good job of capturing important chart features as well as, uh, you know, price action, price momentum. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had something like this on the futures side, uh, but then I had, to, uh, I had to modify it and change it quite significantly, uh, completely different sort of logic to make it work on the stock side. So the idea is, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, when you open your iPhone, you don't say, I'm not going to use the iPhone until you, I tour the manufacturing facility in China. You know, you just kind of use it. And, uh, you know, if you like it, you like it. If you don't like it, you know, you don't. That's the way it is. Uh, then uh, there was some, you know, wondering uh, some some comment about whether this, uh, the, this the rotational aspect would be similar to RRG. Uh, all I would say is that you should go back and revisit the last week's interview with uh, Julius, uh, which is, I think, on the YouTube and on, on your Facebook page and, and uh, you know, carefully pass his comments and see whether after that you're still convinced you want to use RRG. And then uh, in terms of the weekly CTM, uh, yeah, some people have uh, on some charts that there's not enough data, you will not see values of the weekly CTM. So it's not that uh, it can't be calculated, but it needs, of course, more data in order to uh, perform the calculation. So you should be able to see it. Uh, and if you don't see it, it just means that for whatever reason, maybe it's a new ETF or a new stock uh, or a new, list, new listing and there's not enough data available to calculate it out. And then uh, uh, one of the uh, questions was, uh, could you use this as a leading indicator, perhaps for an exit strategy? And uh, the basic uh, question there is that, uh, what is your time frame, right? I mean, uh, obviously you can generate signals on a longer time frame or entries on a longer time frame and exits on a shorter time frame or vice versa so uh, if you if you draw a two by two grid and if you write speed of entries and speed of exits do you want to combine slow entries and slow exits or slow entries and fast exits or fast entries with slow exits or fast entries with fast exits and that just depends on how you want to design your trading strategy and uh, then obviously if you want fast and fast you can have use the intraday data, uh, say if you want to have slow and fast, you can have weekly entries and daily exits and so forth. So you can use a, uh, the CTM on a shorter time frame to make it a leading indicator for a trade that you have on a longer time frame. So you could have a week, uh, say a trade that you're really running on a weekly time frame, and then you could use 
uh, daily CTM on the daily time frame to give you some heads up or some leading uh, sense of whether it's weakening. For example, if you want to add to a position, then you could look for weakness on the daily data in order to enter a position or add to your position uh, on the weekly data and so on. And uh, since we know that it's very easy to change the time frame, uh, it works very seamlessly. So, you know, once you can go intraday data, the possibility is really amazing because you can use two hour charts, one hour charts, 30 minute charts. You know, you can have all the flexibility in the world and the interpretation stays exactly the same. So that's the beauty of it. Um, and then uh, there was a question of lag. Uh, you know, does it, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, yes, it does have lag. It does have smoothing because uh, by definition, uh, we have to have some smoothing because otherwise it's not possible to uh, have um, a, you know, a nice smooth indicator that doesn't change uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, it's not too jittery. But uh, again, uh, because we have this ability to hop time frames, you can, uh, if, the, if it's too laggy for you, you just have to shorten your time frame. If it's too fast for you, you just have to extend your time frame. So again, uh, you can imagine that as a designer, there's no way to anticipate uh, the needs of every single trader. But because we can hop across time frames, uh, it's no problem. You know, you can adapt. Or you can uh, you can sort of look at the lag on the daily data, sort of calibrated versus what you would like to do. You can decide whether that's too fast or too slow for you. And if it's too slow, you you can go to a shorter time frame. If it's too fast, you can go to a longer time frame. So it's simply a matter of uh, adapting to the indicator. So if if you are a discretionary trader, but you want something quantitative to look at then you can use CTM as a standby and you can say, oh, okay, here's another thing. Uh, here's another thing I can look at it. And then uh, there was a question on, does it have cyclic analysis? And the answer is no, there's no cyclic analysis. Now, uh, uh, now the, this goes into a, now the question is, uh, it, it does have some moving averages. So you can think of moving averages as a cyclic filter. You know, it's going to filter out, uh, you know, stuff that's uh, much shorter than the particular length. So, um, but there's no explicit attempt to include cyclic analysis uh, in the thing, uh, in the in the design of the process. And then, uh, uh, you know, could you use? Uh, there's another question on could you use Bollinger Bands for breakouts? And uh, of course, the answer is yes. Uh, again, I have a, if you look at my posts, I think there's one post post early on that I talk about uh, get uh, you know communicate more clearly with the market or get closer in touch with the market, something like that. And that describes and discusses the models in detail. So um, you can uh, so you can see how I have uh, uh, set it up and see how um, you know it can uh, uh, sort of uh, help you formulate whether you want to use it as a, for a breakout or not. And then um, uh, the question is, how do I use it? Uh, I primarily use it as a screening tool. I have other screening tools, and I use it as a, a, an important part of my screening process. And then uh, I have to decide whether I want to, uh, you know, hold something or not. And, uh, you know, I try to be a longer term trader. So the move in Boeing is an example this year of a trade that, uh, you know, I would love to have done. Uh, I only did a very small portion of it. But um, that's an example of something you just buy and hold and hold for a long time. You have to be really patient. There's lots of noise back and forth. Uh, the experts, you know, like me, you know, pushing you this way or that way. Uh, there's always, uh, so I think the, the real challenge in any of these uh, trading uh, applications is that you have to be, you have to have a very clear idea of how you are going to trade. And then you have to live in the bubble and ignore everybody else. And uh, that's easier said than done. I did that for 20 years and I can tell you it's not that easy uh, because there's always, uh, you know, it's very easy to be influenced by other people's opinions because, uh, you know, the human brain is not designed for trend following. You know, we don't, we don't have the patience to sit over there and grind it out day after day after day. But, uh, you know, we've had some spectacular moves and certainly IPGP was an example uh, that we had yesterday on yesterday's show. Uh, Boeing is another example. Cognos is another example. There's so many of them this year because of the fabulous trend we've had in the market. And uh, so the idea is that, uh, you know, pick your process and stick to it and, you know, whatever makes sense to you. Uh, and, you know, CTM is just one tool that you can use in the process. And then... Yeah. Uh, well, I was just gonna, I was just going to uh, follow up on that because I think that's really important. First of all, I think uh, the CTM or any other indicator at stock charts, you really have to understand it um, and and what it means and and what you're looking for and does it fit your trading style. 
you know, because when I asked you earlier about some of the, you know, short term trades, and I think even before we went on the air, I was talking about, you know, I might hold a trade or a stock for maybe a couple of days. And uh, all I heard was silence on your end. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's got a different trading style. But what I wanted to do real quick was just to grab the screen. I want to show everyone, um, because you mentioned this earlier, Tushar, that uh, at Stock Charts, all these indicators have explanations if you go into the chart school. And here is basically the CTM. So if you go in and you just go into the search and just type in Shande Trend Meter, you're going to get the uh, CTM, what we've been talking about, what uh, Shande has been talking about throughout this show. And you can see that the calculation has um, influences from the Bollinger Bands, um, price change relative to the standard deviation, the RSI. That was the first thing I had picked up on. It just kind of looked like the RSI. And I've got an interesting chart I'll show you. And, you know, feel free to comment on that, uh, Tushar, when you look at this. Um, And then finally, the existence of any short term breakouts, price channel breakouts. So with that, what I did is I t- took Intel, that was one of the 10 in 10 stocks, and I pulled up the weekly chart to give it more of a longer term feel. I left the MACD up there, we just ignore that for now. Um, but down the bottom, I took your CTM and I overlaid the RSI, the 14 RSI, and it's not exact, that's for sure. I mean, there's definitely a lot of differences based on some of the other influences that we just talked about. But there are times when they do kind of, you know, look like one another moving up and down. So I would say that the RSI, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the RSI does have a significant influence in the calculation. Not, of the at, all. Uh, not at all. The, uh, this is, this is okay. just an eyeball convincing you that uh, it looks like the RSI. Okay. Um, RSI has um, much less than 10% weighting, so there are lots and lots of other things contributing to it. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I just wanted to use the RSI, I would use the RSI. I mean, but I, I don't actually use the RSI as it is. Uh, I use the, uh, what I call the, I convert, I take the inverse of the RSI, so I convert it into uh, the, uh, the buying power. And the reason I use that is uh, you need some short-term measure of price activity, like there is a price thrust and you want to be able to capture it. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, there are lots of other things going on. And uh, you got to remember that you have to take a step back and ask, you know, where is this thing coming from? It's coming from the price itself. So if you look at the RSI, the RSI kind of looks like the underlying price. If you look at the CTM, it looks like the underlying price because it is the underlying price recast in a different way and combined in a different way with, uh, uh, you know, other measures of momentum. And uh, if you think of the CTM, the CTM is trying to eyeball the chart, if you will, and say, hey, I find this pattern and that pattern and that pattern and that pattern, and we're going to wait this way, that way, this way, that way. And uh, you can see that the rate of change of the CTM is not the same as the RSI. And uh, of course, it looks like the price because it's coming from the price. And if you look at the RSI and the CTM, you'll see some similarities from time to time. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the weight of the RSI is quite small because the problem with the RSI is that it only looks at a very small time frame, a short time frame, like 14 days or 14 bars or whatever, uh, depending on your time frame. And also, it has really funky smoothing inside. Like if you look at the RSI values, they have, uh, this was, the RSI was developed before there were computers, so they had to use shortcuts. And for its time, it was a really brilliant solution. And I, uh, you know, hats off to him. And I actually have an original uh, uh, signed copy of the book uh, of Wells Wilder's book. So it's one of the most interesting things I have. And uh, so I, I have enormous respect for the indicator. It was done at a time and it was really, really difficult to do anything. Everything was done by hand. So it's a brilliant solution for its time. Uh, but I think it has a few quirks and, uh, you know, it, it is there, but it's a very small part of the CTM itself. Okay. One thing that I, I um, highlighted here on this chart, on the weekly uh, Intel chart, and just wanted to get your comments on this because, I, you know, when I trade using the MACD and RSI and so right. forth, I right. use negative divergences. Right, right. And I'm just wondering, you know, looking back at uh, 2012 when right. Intel was making this move on the weekly chart to the upside, right. I noticed that the uh, CTM was moving lower. Do you, do you look at this because it is a momentum type indicator? Do you look at that as slowing momentum when you see a CTM dropping with price going up? You know, this is, a, this is a, again, a tough question. So uh, my answer is no. Uh, I don't believe in divergences because uh, the problem with divergences is you don't know what the result of the divergence is going to be. Is the move after the divergence going to be a small move or a large move? 
and uh, I'm a trend follower. So that means that I'm not predicting uh, where the price is going to go. So if I take a divergence today, uh, it might hurt me tomorrow because I could have a divergence and the price could end up much higher. So the way I look at it is I have a trailing stop. The trailing stop is going to get me out. I'm going to give up some equity or some open trade equity to get out. But that's the price of my trend following philosophy. So I'm not trying to, so I understand where you are and you could certainly make a case that there's a divergence and so you could have a short term trade. But then I would do the, I would still be a trend follower by going to a shorter time frame, mm -hmm. right? So for example, at that time, if I'd gone to a 30 minute chart, I have not seen this, I'm speculating, maybe the CTM would drop below into the red region and stay there. So if I wanted to, uh, I could still be a trend follower but on a 30 minute time uh, time frame and accomplish what you're doing. But uh, I personally do not use divergence because I just don't believe in it because I don't know what the result of the divergence is going to be. Is it going to be a small move or is it going to be a big move? And you know, there's no way to know. Okay. Uh, well, we are running uh, short on time. So I don't know, do you want to give everyone, you know, the, uh, your website where they can follow okay. along? Uh, you can, uh, of course I have the blog uh, on stock charts. So you can certainly look at that. Uh, you can look at my website, uh, stockcharts.com and other etfmeter.com, where I primarily have these uh, summary tools and the uh, data. But uh, since you have CTM on stock charts, this, uh, um, the other information is more interesting and useful. What was uh, the website? I, what was the website again? Too sure. Etfmeter.com. All one word. All right. Just want to show everybody. Right, so uh, you can see at the top that uh, that's a summary just of the uh, the dials for the S and P 500. It tells you that uh, on long term basis, I'm only 70 percent in on the market, even though it's the, uh, and you see where the trend meter is, and my year year ahead forecast is 15 percent. And one of the things that's really interesting is I have a commentary feature, so you can uh, you can you know you can click on it and you can see for yourself you can uh, you can see my automated commentary analysis of the web page or, or the particular chart and i think uh, you know for all you discretionary traders that's an example of where i can uh, synthetically or based on numbers only write a commentary every day automatically generated that looks amazingly realistic as though i were writing it out myself so if you're looking for a little amusement on the weekend uh, you can log in and uh, and look at the uh, you know if you and and read the commentary. Uh, so if, uh, if you could uh, if you could just click on the analytics uh, tab. Uh, okay. Tom. Yeah. Uh, the on the top, on the top um, menu, the analytics tab. Yeah. Do you see it? I I clicked on it. Okay. Uh, all right. And if you uh, oh sorry I see uh, I'm on the wrong screen here as usual. Uh, uh, if, if you just click on the commentary uh, portion, uh, the CT, you know, the, the blue line that says uh, F, you know, the, yeah, just click on the, no, the, the uh, yeah, individual, yeah, just click on that. And see, there's a, a automated commentary. And, uh, you know, you can, uh, you, you know, it, it tells you, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, and gives you a summary. And yeah. it's kind of a neat little thing because, uh, you know, uh, you can automate the computers to do anything. And here's, uh, you know, here's an example of uh, writing you a summary of what the chart is saying uh, purely based on whatever is happening internally on a, from a numbers basis. Excellent. Well, I tell you what, this has been uh, great having you on the show. Thank you uh, so very, much. Yeah, very, very interesting information. It's a, you know, it's a different uh, approach, but that's cool. I like having, you know, everyone's input from stock charts. We have a lot of great analysts and, and you take a little bit different approach. And I think this is a, a really interesting one as well. Uh, no doubt about it. We'll have to have you back on the show again soon for sure. Oh, thank you so very much. Thanks to Erin and for all the listeners this morning. I hope I haven't totally bored you guys to tears and uh, hopefully <laughs> uh, we'll come back and uh, have another go at it. Well, the question box, uh, the live chat was very lively, so I don't think you put anybody to sleep. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, yeah, it, was a, it, it was a great presentation. We really enjoyed having you on here too, Sharon. Come back I again soon. At the beginning, you know, when you argue before the Supreme Court, you, you start by saying, may I please the court? So that's pretty much our sign off with. <laughs> well, I, liked, I liked one of your comments earlier where you said you stuck your finger in the blender because I feel like I've done that many times here. Oh, don't tell me about it. Uh, uh, pretty soon I'm going to have no fingers left. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, again, thanks again for stopping by and we'll have you on again real soon. Thank you so very much.
Hi, this is Arthur Hill, Senior Technical Analyst with StockCharts.com. This instructional video will cover line studies in chart notes. Here are the topics and the timeline for today. We'll show you where to learn more about these line studies in our chart school. We'll show you how to draw Fibonacci retracements and quadrant lines. Then we'll turn to Fibonacci arcs and time zones. We'll show you how easy it is to draw cycle lines, circles, and the sine wave. Then we'll show you the Roth regression channel and Andrew's pitchfork. And finally, we'll draw the Fibonacci fan and speed lines. Learning more about line studies in chart school. First, I will show you where you can find more information about these line studies. There's a drop down menu at the top of every web page, and there you can access the chart school. If you don't see that, it means your browser is not quite opened wide enough. And there you can see the main links for stock charts. So if I click on the chart school, I will then go to the chart analysis section. From here, I can scroll to the bottom or I can go to the outline and click chart annotations tools. And there are the chart school articles. Drawing Fibonacci retracements and quadrant lines. Chartists can access the line studies from the left-hand toolbar. In the middle, you will see three arcs and a little triangle at the top of that button. And if you click on that button, you'll get a little pop-out and all of the available line studies will be shown. The first line study is the Fibonacci retracement. I can click that to select it, move to the point where I want to start my retracements, Click, hold that click down, and drag to draw your retracements. Once you draw your retracements, you will see yellow handles, and you can use those yellow handles to adjust the retracements as you see fit. You can also click in the middle of the line to move the entire retracement. And you can also hide or show the price levels. You can see I've got price levels here. And if I hold down the control key and click on that line, they disappear. And if I click again, they reappear. We can also add additional Fibonacci lines by holding down the control key and clicking the yellow handle and dragging. And you can see that additional Fibonacci levels appear on the Fibonacci retracement. If you would like to see additional Fibonacci levels every time you use the Fibonacci Retracements tool, simply select Fibonacci Retracement, move to the point you want to draw, hold down the Control key, click and drag, and you can see those extra Fibonacci levels will automatically appear. And of course, you can add and remove those extra levels by holding down the Control key and dragging the yellow handles. You can easily adjust the line width or the colors for these line studies by first selecting the line study. I'll click the select button at the top left, and then I will click on the Fibonacci retracements to activate it. And then I can choose any of these colors. There's the three most recently used colors, or I can use the drop down to get a broader array of colors. And once I select the color, I can also adjust the line width. The quadrant lines annotation works similar to the Fibonacci retracements. Click on the annotation to select, move to your starting point, click, hold that click down, and drag to draw your quadrant lines. You will see the yellow handles, and you can adjust those to adjust the quadrant lines, or you can move the entire quadrant by clicking that middle line and you can see the quadrant will expand and contract based on the high-low range in that particular area. The Fibonacci Arc and Fibonacci Time Zone. Chartists can add a Fibonacci Arc by going to the line studies and selecting Fibonacci Arc. You can start from a high. Click, hold that down, and drag to a point you want to stop at, a high to a low, and your arcs will appear. You can use the yellow handles to move that Fibonacci arc, and you can also draw from a low to a high. 
The Fibonacci time zone works with just one click, well two, you select it and then click where you want to draw it. And you can see it starts off with the Fibonacci sequence and extends. And you can move that along the date axis, but you cannot change the spacing on the Fibonacci time zone. Next, we will move to cycle lines, cycle circles, and sine waves. The cycle line study makes it really easy to measure and analyze cycles. We'll select the cycle line annotation, click and drag to start our cycle lines. And you can see there's a number here with a yellow handle. I can click and drag that yellow handle to make the cycle longer or shorter. And then I could also click on any of the other lines to move the entire cycle as I see fit. The cycle circles are similar. I will click to activate it, click and drag to make my cycle circles. And then I can click on the line to move it where I want on the chart. And I can click on this yellow handle to make the cycle longer or shorter. The sine wave works a little bit different. I will select it and then I will click and drag, but you also have to drag up and down as well as right and left to adjust your sine wave. And then you can click in the middle of the sine wave to move the entire annotation. Drawing the Roth Regression Channel and the Andrews Pitchfork. The Roth Regression Channel is drawn similar to a trend line. I'll select the Roth Regression Channel, go to my starting point, click, hold that down, and drag. And you can see the channel will take shape. We have, of course, yellow handles we can use to adjust that channel. You can click in the middle of the channel, that line there, to move the entire channel. And you can see how it adjusts to the price range it is currently in. Andrew's Pitchfork works just a little bit differently. When you select that annotation, you move to the chart and you click three times on the places you want to draw that pitchfork. One, two, three, and I will get my pitchfork. And then I can use those handles to adjust the pitchfork and I can click and drag one of the lines to move the entire annotation. Adding the Fibonacci fan and speed lines to your chart. The Fibonacci fan works similar to a trend line. You will move to your starting point, click, hold that click down, and drag to your ending point, and your Fibonacci fan will appear. You can use the yellow handle to adjust your fan line as you see fit, or you can move the entire fan. The speed lines work pretty much the same way. I'll select the speed lines, click to where I want to start, and drag to where I want to finish. And that concludes this instructional video for chart notes. Be sure to check out our other instructional videos, and thanks for watching.